Good morning, Radius Church. We are so excited that you're worshiping with us today. And if it's your first time here, thank you for joining us for church today. Would you do us a favor and let us know if you're new to Radius? We would love to connect with you and the easiest way to do that is through our virtual connection card. So type new in the comments or you can text the word new to the number on the screen to get connected. And now, from wherever you're watching, let's all stand to our feet and join our church family in worship.
shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else Trust is 
presence of God. There's nothing like worshiping our King. At Radius, we believe in community. You don't have to do life alone. We've created some digital small groups for you to get connected during this time. To take advantage of those, just type Zoom in the comments below and we'll be sure to get you connected. I want to encourage you to stay tuned because in a few moments we're going to hear a message from our pastor. It's a throwback message on how we can create a lifestyle of worship. Are you ready? So grab your pens and your Bibles and let's jump right in. you today. We come to you in Jesus' name, and I ask you, God, to form fit this message to the hearts of the here. I ask you, God, that you open their hearts to receive, that their mind is alert, God. Their heart is receptive to you. I ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that they be able to retain spiritually and, and, and mentally, and, and, and Father God, in their soul, the things that you want them to get today. Father God, transfuse just, just, just your power today in their life, and I thank you, God, that they'll find themselves, and they'll find themselves ultimately in you, so that, God, their lives could be changed, but not only their lives could be changed, God, they can also change the lives of others around them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name and those who agree said, amen. amen. So let's get into today's message. Uh, the whole goal of this series called Closer is to get us to understand what worship truly is. I'm convinced being in ministry my whole life, being raised a pastor's kid, being in church my whole life, and then now being a pastor for nearly 15 years, I'm convinced that people truly don't know what it means to worship God. They have an idea of what it means, but they really don't know the heart behind it. They don't truly understand it. And so sometimes when we think of worship, a lot of times we think religious songs. We think of songs. We think of music in church. We think of things that we sing. And that's a part of it, but that's not really the heart of worship. And last week we gave you this thought. If you weren't here, I'm going I'm to go over it just real quick, is that we all worship something. It doesn't matter if you're here in this room, if you're a follower of Christ, or if you're, if you're not a follower of Christ, we all worship something. Something gets our attention. Something gets our adoration. Something gets, uh, gets the things that, that we give our, our calendar to, and our agenda to, and our time to. There's something that gets that, and it's something that we actually worship. And you're like, well, I don't really call it like worship. Well, it, it actually is. And let me tell you this. I'm going to say this right off the bat, and I said this last week. God does not mind you adoring things. He doesn't mind you adoring someone. In fact, if you're married, you should adore your spouse. You should. You should hold them and give them t calendar time and hold them in high regard. You should. The, God only has an issue when you put it above him. When you put the things that you adore you put it above him, that's when he has um, issue, with, issue with it. And so today, uh, we're going to get into more theology today. In fact, today 
is probably going to be the most theological message that I've ever preached at this church. You guys are used to me giving you a lot of application, and we're going to give you some of that today. We're going to help apply it to your life. But today is going to be really theological, and I want you to see this because a lot of times, uh, there's, most Christians won't even go through this part of the Bible. They won't even kind of get to this, this part of the Bible, and therefore they don't really have a concept of what it means to, to worship God. So we're going to go to the deep end of the pool today. Is this all right? I only got one. This is all right. All right. So we're going to go to the deep end of the pool, and uh, you say, what's that? Uh, well, it, we're just going to get a little bit more uh, theological. So just lean in today and lean into the scripture, and there's so much symbolism behind worship. So here's the question that we're asking today, is who was the first worshiper? There was a worshiper who was first. Who, who was the first worshiper? And the answer might, might surprise you. Um, it actually might surprise you. And, and, the, and why do we need to know this? Why do we even need to know who the first worshiper was? Well, one of the laws of Bible study is called the law of first mention. And the law of first mention what it is, is it's the, the first place where uh, worship was even mentioned in the Bible. So really what it means is the, the purest teaching of anything is in the place where it is first mentioned. And the first worshiper in the Bible is a person by the name of Lucifer. And I want to actually describe that to you a little bit. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you about angels and stuff like that. So please just follow along, and we're, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to talk about why this is so important at the end. We're going to give you some information, but it's very important, and we're going to really use it, and we're going to come full circle how it actually applies to your life here at the end. Amen, everybody. So there was an angel. The first angel we're going to talk about, his name was Michael. Michael. And every single time you see Michael in the Bible, it always corresponds to prayer. It always corresponds to prayer. He's always responding to people praying. So the way we pray, or the scripture tells us that angels are released in the heavenly realms. Now, this kind of, you know, this can seem a little crazy to you. It's like, you know, I would just pray to God. It's directly to God. Yeah, but what you don't understand is, is that God has angels, which are called messengers, and they are sent to carry out the prayers of the saints to and from God. Check this out. In Daniel chapter 10, it talks about this. And it talks about this encounter that, that God had with Daniel and, and, and about there was an angel. It says, so Daniel, since the first day you began to pray, so the first time you began to pray, your request has been heard in heaven. So I heard your request. I heard your request, Daniel. And then it said this, and I have come in answer to your prayer. Then it says this, but, but what? But the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Interesting, there's like a war going on here uh, in the heavenly realms. As then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. So Michael, one of the archangels, came to, 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 to help. Why? To help with the prayer. So there is a war going on in the heavenly realms even whenever we pray. This is actually is happening. Spiritual warfare, it's actually called things that we don't even see and know that it's going on, but it's happening. When you pray, there is angels literally taking, taking the prayers that you have access to God, taking them up to God and sending them from God back to you in answered prayer. This is kind of exciting stuff, right? And so I'm not going to get too much into that. Just know that it's true, and I'll let you guys kind of look at that on your own. The second angel in the Bible, his name was Gabriel. Now, Gabriel uh, always came with a word. Anytime you see Gabriel in the Bible, he always came with a word. Obviously, you know he, he's the one who came to Mary. So he came with a message. He came with a word. He came uh, uh, with, with a message. And the third angel that was in the Bible that was created, his name was Lucifer. And Lucifer was in charge of the worship. He was in charge of the worship. So notice these three things, these three archangels. One was Michael and he always corresponds to prayer. One was Gabriel, who always corresponds to the word. And one was Lucifer, who was in charge of the worship. And so what's interesting about this list is that all of heaven is represented in these three things. It, all of heaven, prayer, worship, and the word, all of heaven is represented. And so it says in Revelations, if you know anything about this name, Lucifer, well, this is, is the name of Satan. 
And, and actually what it says um, in Revelation, when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him. He took a third of the angels with him, and those angels are now uh, demons. And so I know we're getting theological, just kind of stay with me here. And so I personally believe, because of those three archangels, that you know, uh, there, a third was worship with Lucifer, because he took a third. Third was Michael was in charge of, and a third that Gabriel was in charge of, okay? And so, again, I, I believe this should be modeled even in our church. Think about this. I believe, so when we come to this place, what, what should be prevalent in this place? There should be prayer, there should be the word of God, and there also should be worship. What are the three things that God is asking of you in your relationship with him? He wants you to come before him. And we talked about this last week. He, he, he wants to give you his word. He wants you to have communication with him and, and offer him uh, and pray so he can communicate with you as well. And then he wants you to worship him. Some of your brains are starting to work. This is, this is interesting. And so, um, you know, um, I'm telling you what, if, if you're wondering how to get close to God, that's, that's the, what we call the 15-minute challenge. Uh, take five minutes. Take five minutes to worship God. Take five minutes uh, to read your Bible and take five minutes to pray. It's what we call the 15-minute challenge. It's what we encourage everybody to do every single day. But you notice all three of those things, and, and all the three of those things in the heavens corresponded to an archangel. And now today we're gonna talk about uh, one of those archangels, we're going to talk about Lucifer, and because we're talking about worship, and he was in charge of it, and we're going to look at what it really means. And so we're going to talk about the first, the first worshiper. And so what I want, to want to do is I want to go to Isaiah chapter 14, because Isaiah gives an account, and, and it talks about this encounter that happened uh, in the heavenly realm. There's an encounter that happened, and, and, and it really talks about it. And so if, if you have your Bible, um, you, you can turn there. It's going to be on the screen or in your notes. And if you look in the context of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 14, it says it is written to the king of Babylon, the king of Babylon. They'll, they'll say, it'll say this, this is written to him. But what, what I want you to notice is this, is that sometimes in Scripture, whenever uh, God refers to somebody or something, he's not actually just talking to the person He's talking to the spirit that's behind it. Now, if you've been in church any length of time, there's a story where Jesus, uh, um, he has an encounter with Peter. And, and, and Peter said, uh, as encountering Jesus, said, no, no, Lord, you're not gonna die. I'm, I'm gonna stand up for you. And, and Jesus looks at Peter and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. So if, if, if you know that story, you understand that Jesus, even though he was talking to Peter, he was actually talking to the spirit that was behind Peter. And this is what's going on here. Now, now, now track with me. It says this, verse 12, how you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. So what does this mean? So Satan was an angel of God who got expelled. He got expelled. And most scholars believe that this happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. In uh, the verse 2, it says, and the earth became formless and void. And the verse 1 says, God said, let there be light. And so, of course, the earth became void, void because Satan was expelled to the earth, right? And in between verse 2 and 3, it says, God, let there be light. And he said, God said, I'm going to bring some light to all this darkness, Okay? And so uh, that Lucifer created when he was expelled from heaven, okay? So that, that, that pretty much was the, the correlation between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3. You guys track with me right now? You guys doing all right? Okay, so we're, we're gonna bring this. And so, so the question is, is why did Lucifer get expelled? Why did he get expelled from heaven? How, why? You know what I mean? Why, why did this happen? This is what he said. You said in your heart, and I want you to notice the heart of, of, of Lucifer, this is how his heart. He said, I, I want you to know, let's go back to that. Oh, here we go. You said in your heart, bleh. you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount. Look at these words of the assembly. On the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. 
In other words, he's trying to elevate himself. Next scripture. It says, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And of all the names of God, he called God the most high. So I'll say that Lucifer, he had an, an altitude problem, not just an attitude problem, not just a heart problem, okay? And so what it really meant was, in his heart, he resents the fact that God was getting all the attention. God was getting, he, he, he resented that fact and all the worship, so he just really decided at one point that I'm gonna be above. I'm going to be above. And I point this out to you because that is still his goal today. His goal today, Lucifer's goal, Satan's goal, is to want to be above God to get you and to get you to put the things of this world, the things of this earth above God because if he can get you to do that, in other words, he understands that uh, you're in, in, in fact not putting God at the place where he should be, that you're in fact putting him. Are you tracking with me here? You guys, you guys doing okay? And so um, he wants to get all the attention off God and onto anything else, onto anything else. And that's the truth, because if he can get your attention, he actually gets the worship of it because he accomplished the diversion of it, which is why we gotta be very careful about what we worship. We gotta be very careful about what we worship. I know this is deep. I know this is theological, so just, just track with me real quick. And so if you understand this, you understand Jesus had an encounter with Satan, and Satan tempted Jesus, and when Satan tempted Jesus, and it, it, it wouldn't have been a temptation if it didn't say it was, so it was a temptation. And J Satan told Jesus, if you, I will give you all this. I will give you all this world. I will give you everything. He took him up, up a high on the mountain. He said, I'll give this all to you if you bow down and you will worship me. That's what it says. And so I'm gonna give you one more verse on this. So your, your passion, your energy, your devotion, it's really important. Here's one more verse. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11. It says this, talking about this. It says, your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. The sound of your stringed instruments. So, so this is talking about Lucifer and he's talking about his, his makeup. And don't worry about this. That's actually part of my notes. But so, um, right. And so he, he's, he is, it says that his being was a stringed, like he, he, and part of his being was a stringed instrument. Not, not, not that he had one, that part of his being was a stringed instrument. Right, not like Beauty and the Beast, right? Not like, you know, he was something, that he, he turned into something, but that, that he actually had that. And, and most scholars believe that Part of his being, his overall makeup, he had attributes of being an instrument. Now, the second place this is taught is in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 17. I want to show this to you. And it says this. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. He was talking about Lucifer. You were, you were, you were perfect. You were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty. You were in the Garden of Eden and the Garden of God. And every precious stone, and that's important, we're coming back to this, but just know that God adorned him in jewelry, in jewels. He put jewels on him. Verse 13, it says, your settings and mountings, it's kind of important, your settings and mountains were made of gold on the day you were created, they were prepared. On the day, so the King James says it this way, it says, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. So he actually, part of his being was, was timbrels and, 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 and pipes. So is, is, this is what his being had. And I'm gonna explain to you some things about music that you might not even know. Why are we telling you all this? I'm, I'm telling you this, this is gonna come to a point. So you need to understand that every instrument that is in music falls into one of three categories. One of three categories. Number one is stringed instruments. This is your guitars, your piano. Piano is actually a, a string instrument. Uh, your violins, um, harps, all that stuff. That's stringed instruments. Number two, percussion instruments. That's drum, drums and cymbals and anything that you hit to make noise. 
And, and then uh, the next one is wind instruments, which is basically flutes and, and trumpets and, 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 and horns and, and all of that. And so something that you blow to, to make noise. So you got to make noise. So you got so you got string, you got percussion, and you got wind instruments. What you need to know is that Lucifer had all three of these on his being. All three of these things on the being, on, on, on him. It actually was a part of his makeup. Why? He was heaven's worship leader. Another scripture, again, going back to Ezekiel 28, says this. It says, you were anointed. So not only did he have all these attributes, he said, you were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. What does that mean? You were anointed. There is an anointing on music, right? Anybody in here like music? Raise your hand if you love music. I'm telling you what, there's music that you listen to that'll pump you up when you work out. There's music that you listen to. It's funny, you know, you can watch a movie and you could cry your eyeballs out, but I guarantee you it probably wouldn't happen if you didn't have that nice, soft music behind creating that scene for you, making you be like, oh my God, this is so crazy. I mean, you, you, right? you have that there and it creates emotion. There is an anointing on music itself. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. He was anointed. And when he did it, so when, whenever Lucifer was a cherub in, uh, in the heavens, when he, used to, when he used to use his instruments, it was so powerful. Stuff happened. It wasn't, just wasn't pleasant to the ear. It, it, it shapes culture. It shapes culture. And we know today that music literally shapes the culture that we live in. Do you not agree? Music will shape the culture around you, and it'll shape you. And let me just say it this way. What you listen to actually shapes you. And so God put anointing and power into music, and it'll move you. Cultures have been shaped by their music. I know that ours has as well. And to let you know, Satan is still anointed through music. Satan still gets his agenda out through music. This is true. And, I, and I'm not trying to be your Holy Spirit. I'm just, just I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. This is so important. And I'm going to read this. Uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14 through 17. It's in your notes. And, and I want to show you this correlation and how this pertains to us. It says this, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created, and this is the encounter, till wickedness was found in your heart. Through your widespread, this is an important word here, trade. This is very important because what Satan did, he, he replaced what belonged to God and he took it for himself. He, he, he took what belonged to God for himself. We got to be careful we don't do that. And then it said, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. And your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom. Why? You corrupted your wisdom. Next one. Because of your splendor. You corrupted it. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Before kings. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus talks about this. And he said, I saw, late, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So here's the thing. You got these archangels, one's in charge of the word, one's in charge, right, of, of prayer, and you got, now you got a vacant position. You got one who was in charge of worship, tried to exalt himself, he got kicked out. Now there is a job opening. I wonder who's supposed to fill that job. I wonder who's supposed to fill that job opening. So here's the question. Write this down. Who is the new worship leader? Who is the new worship leader? And guess what? It's you. It's me. I am. You are. This is important to know. This is so important to know. Because, listen to me real quick. Everything that God created in Lucifer... He put in you and on you so that we would do the job. 
He put in you and on you so that we would do the job. We need to make sure that our worship is directed back to him. We were created to bring worship to God. I'm going to show this to you. So here's the thing. I want you to know something kind of, that's something that's kind of cool. You, when God created you, because now there is a vacant position in heaven, uh, there's, there's an, a job opening for, the, for, for worship leader or, or people who to worship God. And I just totally believe that God created us in his image and in his likeness. But he created us in our being the ability to worship God. Now I told you how Satan had all three of those instruments on his being. Did I not? Now check this out. In your throat, there are two strings. They're called your vocal cords. There are two strings that, that go down, and they're called your vocal cords. Check this out. The wind instrument is your lungs. It's your lungs. where well, you can breathe in, and you can breathe out. And the wind passes through the strings, right? You say, well, what about percussion? <laughs> I mean, the Psalms is littered with scripture that says, clap your hands, make a joyful noise. So what God did to replace the worship that Satan, that, that, that Lucifer did when he got kicked out, he created you and he created me with the same exact attributes to be able to bring the worship back to God. Can you see this? Do you see this? You, in fact, were created to worship him. Amen. You see this? And so what is all this supposed to mean? I mean, you, what is all this supposed to mean? What do I take away from this? Well, there's three things that I really want you to know. We're going to get into some practical things. And I really, want, I really want Radius Church to embrace. I want you to embrace these things. Because this is the reason why we were created. We were the replacement. This is why Satan can't stand you. This is why he hates you. This is why he tries to bring so much turmoil to you. Why? Because you took his position. And God put his spirit in you. You were actually at the place where he wanted to be. Think about this. Think about this. I know this is theological. It's going to hit you in, in a moment. It's, it, it's crazy. I want you to write this down. Write this down in your notes. Write this down. I want you to embrace these things. Number one, God made me from him. From him. In other words, what God, when he made you, he made you from himself. He made you from himself. So here's the deal with creation, okay? I want you to follow me here. God created some things, and then he made some things. He created some, and then he made some things. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? A created thing comes from nothing. It comes from absolutely nothing. And God said, let there be light, and there was. Something created came from nothing. Something that was made was made from something that was created. This is important. This is important. Okay? Uh, here's two distinctions. Look at, look at Scripture on your notes or up on the screen. Genesis 1.1. Uh, 1, 1. So, so, so it says, and God said, let the land produce vegetation seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land. So God didn't say, let there be trees. No, he said, let the land produce vegetation. Okay? There were things that were created, and there were things that were made. This is so important, okay? And so the reason why he made things, the reason why he made it instead of creating it, is that he wanted there to be a relationship from the thing with which it was made. If you took, uh, uh, so if God, you know, if you would have took the, the ground, the soil away from the tree, what's gonna happen to it? Hello? If you take the soil away from the tree, it's gonna die. That, that's what's gonna happen, okay? The soil sustains the tree, and God said, let the vegetation come from the land. He made the tree from the land. Okay, so he basically said this. He said, tree, you were created from dirt. Uh, you're gonna be sustained by dirt and you're gonna go back to being dirt one day. Okay, so if the tree decides not to be close to the dirt, it dies. Okay, 
When God created woman, he took a rib from Adam. Why did he do that? Why did he, why did he take a rib from Adam? Because he wanted there to be a relationship that exists. He wanted there to be uh, something, that, a relationship to, to, to be from that. So he made it, not just created it. So mankind, here's a question, were we created or were we made? <laughs> I'm not gonna answer that question. We were made, we were made, we were made. We were made. Look at Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Let us make mankind in our image. In other words, let's take a part of us and let's put it in mankind. You got that scripture, guys? Let's take a part of us and let's put it in mankind. So, so every one of us were created, we were created from God, okay? And so, yes, our, our, our bodies... Our bodies, uh, you know, were made from the dust, uh, dust of the earth, and we're going to return to dust one day, right? But the reality is our spirit man was, was, was created by God. It was created by God. So that's important that we were created by, sustained by, and we return to God, okay? Your spirit came from God. Your spirit is sustained by God, and your spirit one day will return to God. What does this mean? That this personalizes our relationship to him. Some things, some things were, were made and some things were created. You used to track with me. God made me from him. He, he made me, he said, let us make man in our image. So God created you from him. You are a part of his maker. Can I get an amen, somebody? This is amazing stuff, right? And so this personalizes everything with God. This makes it personal to me. So he, he made me from him. Write this down, number two. God made me to be with him. He made me to be with him. So what does this mean in the context of worship? I'm convinced too many people have just a formal relationship with God, meaning that it's based on habits, like church attendance or prayer or a prayer before food or prayer before bedtime, and we have some habits, and, 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 and they can be great habits, um, but it's, it can be really formal. I mean, I try to stop my kids, and we pray over our food and pray over our meals, but I ask my kids all the time, and I'd say, don't just say a mundane prayer just to say a mundane prayer. Always pray from your heart to God. You because, know, you know, it, at times it could be this, and, you know, Father God, I think of this food, but it's in my body, Jesus, and I pray, man. <laughs> Boom, right? It's like first one grabs, get the most. When you have five kids, you know what I'm talking about? They're all reaching and grabbing for stuff. I want the big cookie. So... All right, this one's browner than the other one. So, you know, because naturally they gravitate towards that. So I, I'm, I don't want you to pray. I don't want you to pray for your day. I don't want you to just pray for it and simply to go through a routine. I want you to pray from your heart to God. Don't, don't be so formal. Make sure your heart is behind your habit. Amen, everybody. And so, uh, and this is not really intended to scare you, but we need to be aware of some things. Je Jesus actually mentions uh, something in Matthew chapter seven. I wanna, want to, uh, to point it to you. He wants a relationship with you. It says this, Matthew seven twenty one. says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It said on judgment day, many is gonna say to me, Lord, Lord, but I'm gonna reply, I never knew you. Now, this is not to bring judgment or condemnation or shame on anybody, but this is a real thing, that God is saying, I want to be close to you. I want to be close to you. And there's people who've come to church and see, you thought I needed your attendance, but I just didn't need your attendance. That was good, but that's not what I wanted. See, God's saying he wants to be close to you. He wants to be close to you. God never created you to be a religious person. Never. He created you to be close to him. He wants to be close to you. Amen, church. Amen. This is what he wants. This is his design. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about this, a correlation between relationships. It says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's what it says in Ephesians. And so this is like a marriage verse. The two is going to become one flesh. Okay? All right? So it's like, yeah, that, that, that's great. 
And I'm sure when you got married, you probably heard that verse. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But, but it says this, as the next statement says, and this is a powerful mystery. And the Apostle Paul wrote this by inspiration of the Spirit of God, says, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. I'm not just talking about a relationship with a husband and wife. I am, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. It talks about a relationship, right? And God said, man, you see that love relationship where the people can't wait to start their life together, they go on their honeymoon and get their lives started and be together every single day? He said, that's what I want, right? I'm telling you, one day when this world ends, one day, we're going to get to heaven and be with Jesus. And people have some crazy ideas about what heaven is like, right? Some people think that we're just going to, there's just going to be a mass choir, and all of a sudden, all the hymn books that were, you know, on, on earth are suddenly going to appear in heaven, Boop. and we're going to sit there, we're just, going to, we're just going to sing in a heavenly choir, right? Some of us think we're going to bow down and not look up for 10,000 years. Some people have some crazy ideas, right? And we're, we're, just, we're just going to lay at the throne of God, and we're going to lay down prostrate, and we're not going to move for 10,000 years. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. No, he don't, he don't want that. He, he, don't, he don't need you to lay down for 10,000 years. In fact, there's angels up there that already do that. In fact, there's one angel up there that flies around the throne. And all he does is go, holy, 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 holy. And that's all he does. And I'm sure God is like, <laughs> is looking around. And that's all he does. He don't need you to, to, lay, to lay down and do that for 10,000 years, right? He doesn't need that. Let me tell you what's going to happen. As soon as you get there, as soon as you get to heaven, you're going to walk an aisle with Jesus himself. He's going to call the church his bride. And the church is going to be wed with Jesus. And after that, we're going to have a reception. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb. And it's going to be a party, okay? Right? It's going to be an awesome party, Okay? And we're gonna, I'm telling you what, we're going to have a nacho bar with lots of sour cream. Can I get an amen, somebody? <laughs> Those of you didn't know, I, I got a story behind that. So we're going to laugh. We're going to be with Jesus. It's the scripture on this, Revelation 21, verse 9, it says this. It says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And then it says, and then what happened? And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me a holy city. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Coming down. This is beautiful. This is called, this is the church. This is you. And check this out. It says this in verse 19. It says, the foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of what? precious stone. The things that he decorated Lucifer with, he decorated you and me with. He dedicated, uh, he decorated his church with, it was decorated with every kind of precious stone. And he talks about what those stones was. The first one is, is Jasper and Sapphire and the third is Agate and Emerald and Onyx and Ruby and Chrysolite and Beryl and Topaz and Turquoise and whatever that thing is. And Amethyst. <laughs> right? And he does all of this because he's in love with you. He does all this because he's in love with you. Listen, he created you for worship. He created you for worship. He created you from him, with him, and to him. The third one is this. Write this down. God made me to express love to him. He made you from him to be with him, and he made you to express love to him. And you know what he wants? All he wants is for you to love him back. That's all that God wants. That's all he wants. He wants you to love him back. That's it. That's it. This is what he wants. This is true worship. In John chapter 4, it talks about true worship. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He said this. He said, yeah, the time is coming, and it's now come. When the true worshipers, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. I'm telling you what, God is looking for worshipers. 
And you're really going to be surprised at what this, this word worship means. You're going to be surprised at this. And I gave you the, uh, on, your, on your handout, I gave you the, the little Hebrew word. And it's actually called proskuneo, proskuneo. And you know what that means? You know what this word means? You guys, some of you, gonna, some of you guys are going to cringe at this, okay? It actually means to kiss. It means to kiss. Thank you, somebody, for preaching that for me. It means to kiss. It actually means to kiss. Like, well, I don't know, kissing God, you know, okay. But we don't really truly understand. What it means is God wants an intimate, he wants a relationship with you. This is what this word, this is what this word worship means. The, the Father is seeking. He said the time is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For this is the kind of worship the Father seeks. This is the kind of, this is the kind of, you know, thing that he wants. And here's the deal, here's the deal. This is not, when you talk about a kiss, this is not like a lover's kiss. It's not like that. This is like the kiss when you kiss your child. When they enter the world and you're, you look at them and you hold on, I'll never forget the first time I, fe- I held my little boy for my firstborn and I just looked and it dawned on me that I was a father and it hits you and it hits you hard and you never understand the love of God uh, there, there, there is there's an expression of the love of God that you truly can't understand until you're holding one of your child in your hand saying wow this is flesh of my flesh you know and, and you just I, I gave him a kiss on his head and I said daddy loves you and I'll be here for you for the rest of your life. And the thing is, is that imagine God when we come to him and he says, you're mine, I lost you. But through my son Jesus, now I found you. And God just wants to hold you in his arms and say, listen, I I wanna be there for you. I wanna be there when you take your first steps. I wanna be there when you stumble and when you fall. I wanna be there when you go through struggle. I wanna be there in the good times. I want to be there for you because I love you. Imagine God is saying he's never loved you any more than he loves you right now. And you were created to worship him. You were created to bring worship to God. So God's looking for people to adore him. And it's interesting. I think of all the words that God could have used for, for worship, he, he actually chose this one. He chose this one. And I'll close with the story. Have you ever been to an airport and you've been walking down, maybe, maybe, you know, after a long flight or something and you start to walk down that elevator and you see balloons and you see flowers, right? And all of a sudden your mind goes, man, I wish that was for me, you know? And maybe it, maybe it has been you. Maybe you got greeted with that. And, and, and you come home. I mean, I've, I remember seeing people who, especially people who are from the military and they would come home and, and they would be greeted with flowers and balloons and the biggest embrace that you've ever seen. And it was different. Why? Because you don't know their story, but you, we people watch all around and, and you see these people and it's like, and there's tears and it's amazing. They're so glad. They're so glad to see each other, so glad to see the family. And I just think that's what God wants from us. That's what he wants from us. He wants us to approach him, to say, God, thank you. And everything that God gives you is way better than anything that you can offer him. God wants to get close to you. Let's get closer. Let's get closer. Make no mistake about it. God wants to get close to you. But some of you today, you just feel like you're far away. You feel like God's a million miles away. And you just maybe feel lost. Can I just tell you, you're not as far away as you think that you are. God wants to lead you right back to him. He wants to become close to you. Remember, it says that we make a step towards God. God makes a step towards us. But Jesus has already done everything he's ever going to do for humanity. 
God already sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the earth to save us, to give us new life. We must take a step towards him to receive his love and to receive his forgiveness. Now, whether or not we're doing that for the first time or whether or not we're just coming back to God after, after being gone for a little while, the first step is us taking that step. It's us coming back to Jesus. So if that's you and you're saying, Aaron, that's me, I need to get closer to God today by taking a step towards Him. I just want to leave you, I want to lead you uh, in a commitment prayer right now. And I promise you that God will meet you right where you are and your sins will be forgiven and you'll be right back on track to getting close to God again. Are you ready? Just say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. I receive him now as my Savior and as my Lord. Lord Jesus, I give you the controls of my life and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I want to say welcome to the family of God. I'm telling you, there's a party in heaven every single time a person commits their life to Christ. It's absolutely amazing. And it's so important now during this next season when we take when we say yes to God is to really understand how to walk this thing out. And we want to help you as a church. We want to help you do that. And we actually need to take some next steps. There actually is some next steps uh, to taking taking a journey um, with Christ. And we want to help you do that. So if you would help us help you by texting the word next to the number on the screen we'd love to get some information to you uh that's really going to help you live out this christian life like it was intended to live get let me just tell you you weren't intended to do this alone you were intended to do this with other people all right so we want to come alongside you and help you in this christian life it's super important uh that you do that and you take some next steps uh, so that way you can be a successful Christian and a successful follower of Jesus. That's what it really is all about. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that you should have it more abundantly. And we're going to help you live the abundant life. And it's not going to be the absence of problems, but you're going to have an anchor in your soul to face every single issue. And not only are you going to have the light of Christ in your life, you're going to be able to share that light with others. And I can't wait uh, to start that journey with you today. Lastly, what I'd like to do today is give you three things that you can do right now uh, as part of the church. Three things that you can do during this season that's really going to enhance and benefit uh, society, that's going to benefit your lives. We can be the church during this season, right? It's, this is not a time for us to just shelter in place and avoid the world. No, we can do three things and we really need to be doing these things um, to advance the kingdom of God. God's not surprised that we're in this season that we're in right now. And I promise you the season's going to come to an end. It seems like it's just this roller coaster thing, but I promise you there is light at the end of the tunnel. And God's going to lead us and guide us through this season. And he's going to do it through you and he's going to do it through me. So here's three things that you can do during this season. Number one is pray. Okay, you can pray. There's never been a better time than right now to pray. Let me just tell you, this world does not need our complaining. That don't do any good. It needs our prayers. Because we, when we pray, we, we submit requests on behalf of God. We have a right to pray. God gave us that right to pray when we said yes to him and became a follower of Jesus. So we have spiritual authority. We actually have power in our lives. And it's released through prayer when we make our petitions known to God. We have so much more power than we think that we do and it can happen through prayer that we actually pray out the exploits and the will of God for our lives and for the lives of others. So I encourage you to pray. Keep continuing to pray every single day. In fact, we're setting our alarms at 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. Uh, along with the initiative called Unite714.com. It's a global prayer, prayer initiative that we're a part of and we're gonna, just going to continue to pray every single day through this pandemic. We're going to pray through it and ask God to move his power and his grace through our life that we can see purpose even through the midst of pain. 
Amen, everybody? So this is something that we need to do. We got to pray. Number two is, is we give. We give our time and our talent, and then we also give our treasure to God. And so I just want to thank you so much for financially supporting the church and being a partner with us to bring hope and healing to this world. It's so important that we keep the church strong during this season and that we get the gospel out. Let me tell you, it's the gospel message that's the hope for this world. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes in it. You see, it's our jobs as Christians to share our light, to share our love, and to share the gospel message. And it's so important to keep the church financially strong during this season so that we can do that. Because guess what? It's not just the message of faith like this message today to you, but it's also what we do with our hands and our feet. It's washing the feet of the city. It's meeting the needs of people. Uh, it's meeting food needs and meeting prayer needs and all the things that we do outreach wise to share the love of other people, share the love of God with other people okay so important that we continue to do that and that's what your giving goes towards I mean it just it goes to help people and because guess what people are the currency of heaven that's why we do that so all the giving options are going to be on the screen in front of you you can give by text you can give online and you can also give uh, through Facebook through the donate button uh, that's down below again we move at the speed of your generosity and I tell you what the more that you're willing to sacrifice, the more that, you, that you're willing to be generous uh, and to share with those in need, the more that we can help other people. That's just the truth. And the cool thing about that is, is God says, if you honor me with your tithes and offerings, he said, I'm going to bless you. Something amazing, when we seek first the kingdom of God, it says in Matthew that all these things will be added to us. When you care about God's kingdom and you start refreshing others, let me tell you, you yourselves will be refreshed. That's what Proverbs says. That's, that's just an amazing thing. Speaking of that, the third thing that we're supposed to do is reach. Reach. Now, we reach by doing two things. We reach by sharing and we reach by serving, okay? So the easiest way for you to reach, and reach is really another word for evangelism, the way that we can do that is to share. Just press share on this message. If this message spoke to you, if it, if it helped you in any way, just press the share button, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on Facebook right now watching this, share the link. I'm telling you, when you share the link, you literally are sharing God's love because it's the gospel being given to other people. That's how amazing that it is. It's as easy as sharing it. And it's just at our fingertips, right? Um, sometimes we discount it because we think it's so easy. But the thing is, is that God can do something amazing through your life when you're willing and obedient to share his message with other people. Never discount what God can do through you. Never discount what a simple share could do. So we got to share. Number two is we got to serve. We got to serve. Now, if you'd like to serve, uh, you can text serve to the number that's on the screen and we'll tell you about all the serving options that we have going on as well as keep you updated to what's getting ready uh, to come out uh, later on down the line. Uh, we're always looking for ways to love our community, to wash its feet uh, and, and all of, just all the different outreach opportunities that we're involved in and the things that we're trying to do in our city to love the least of these. I'm telling you what, Proverbs says this, if you refresh others, you will be refreshed. In fact, Jesus said it this way, you actually end up finding your life through giving it away. We call it at our church, make a difference. Why? Because you never know what purpose feels like until you're making a difference in somebody else's life. That's when your faith comes alive. That's when it matters, is when you are making a difference. And I'm telling you, there's no better way to make a difference than serving. Serving with your gifts, serving with your talents, serving with your generosity, serving by sharing. When we all do our part, we can share God's love with the world. Amen, everybody? Amen. So we could pray, we could give, and we could reach. Let me pray for you today as we end this service. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every person watching today, and I ask you that you would bless them, that you would keep them. Father God, that your face would shine upon them. God, that you would lift up your countenance upon them today and bring them peace. I ask you, God, that you would help us make a difference in this world to let our light and love shine through us, God, that people will see that and they will in turn, God, glorify you and give their lives over to you. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Radius Church, we hope you were encouraged with God's word today. To connect with others in our church community, just join the Radius Facebook group. Also, be sure to follow 
our page, and Pastor Aaron to stay up to date on everything that's happening. We love you, we're praying for you, and we can't wait to see you again soon.